So the topic of the show, actually, speaking of, it is staying invested in the markets. So the, the idea of today is uh, we're, we're trying to figure out or we're trying to discuss here uh, timing the markets versus staying invested in the markets. What's what's a better... You know, people can say, oh, you know, you know, the markets are very expensive. We should get out. We should get out. When someone says that to you, what is your first reaction? My first reaction is tell me what you think you know that the rest of the participants in these enormous many trillions of dollars global markets with sophisticated participants. Like it's a, it's a, it's a big game. Uh, a lot of other investors are staying invested. You're telling me, you know, something that the market doesn't tell me what that is. Tell me what you know. And then the, the answer what, to that will tell you say? a lot about where they are. You know what I've, I've found there's a, someone I'm thinking of who occasionally sends me messages like that, like, Oh, you know, it's going to go down. It's going to crash. And here's the reason a lot of it is like political. So I think people's political beliefs about how the government is handling things or the, the, even the president specifically is handling things has to do with their view on where they think markets are. And then there's the, I, I think it's that like kind of political leanings. And then I think it's the type of media that they take in, right? Like what someone's news feed says, um, wherever that news feed is coming from, I think affects a lot about your your mood and your outlook about the, the markets. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide here, which is essentially, this is the slide from Putnam. And I love this. It's timing the markets, not timing it. That's, I feel like, the, the typical saying that I've used. It, it basically is trying to predict that, you know, the best time to buy and sell is not, is not the way to go. You, you might miss some enormous rallies right after the market tanks. That's usually the case. The recoveries are very, very quick, brutal. They're very high in percentages. So let's say you decide to sell. The next question is, when do you buy back in? And some of these corrections, they're very fast. They happen very quick. And then the recovery is very quick too. So if, let's say, you sold the day after the biggest point drop, it becomes very, very difficult afterwards to capture also the recovery. And so now, net-net, you're probably negative. And it leads me to the next slide, which I think is the most important one in this. Like a 15-year period here, if you stayed invested in the S&P 500, this is also for Putnam, by the way, you would have analyzed a return of 9.88% in the index. You know. And then for the record, real quick, investing in at 12.31.2005, not great timing from an experiential standpoint. That's three, two years before the beginning of the cracks and three, three years before a literal global financial crisis. So bad timing on entry on that, for the record. Exactly. And, and this, so basically this includes a big correction in the market. That's understated. Yeah, correction. <laughs> yes. This includes a literal crisis. Yes. Exactly. And so if you two, missed two there, crises, the 10... 2008 and 2020, oh, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Cause it was March, 2020, yes, right? Yes. Two, cri two literal yeah. global crises. Uh, well, one pandemic, one financial. So the, the, the key here is like, if you missed the 10 best days, because you were out in that market, you will underperform buy and hold strategy by a ton. It is so unfortunate here, <laughs> you'll still be, you know, if, if you only miss the 10 best days, you'll still outperform cash sitting in a bank with no interest rate. You know, the returns are abysmal. And then, and then the, the worst is if you miss 30 days or 40 days, the 30 best days or the 40 best days of, of the market, you actually lost money. This is 15 years, right? And yeah. we're talking about missing 10 days over 15 years. That's an incredibly small number of days as a percentage of this time period. What's the, I mean, there's the, a little bit obvious takeaway is stay invested, but, but is there any other kind of deeper piece about, I don't know, these 10 best days, it seems like they really, really matter. It's a small number of outlier days that matter an incredible amount. Usually it, it ended up happening right after the end of 
the big correction. So in 2000, I would say nine, I think it is like the recovery in, in March was so quick and, and very, very fast. It gives a very little time for the investor to react to that. I actually did a very quick back of the envelope analysis um, by, by setting aside, you know, grabbing the SPY, which is a, um, an ETF of the S&P 500. And I said, that I did a basic rule saying, if the market goes down by more than 2.5%, then I would automatically, like this is an Excel, right? The next cell, I would say, I am going to put zero return there because I'm assuming that after the first day I sell and I'm, I'm going to you know miss that, that day, the next day. If you miss the next day, after the market was down 2.5%, you, over the long run, um, you underperformed the market. I totally buy that. I totally buy that. And it's, I, I think it has to do with regression to the mean. Uh, I really do. Um, these, these, uh, and, and if you actually, this is a more controversial one, but if you buy and hold, obviously you do better. But the big question is, what happens if you sell after 2.5% rise. Okay, so you sell the day after. How does that affect returns? I think it's, it's just... actually a positive. Oh, interesting. Uh, what, what are they like, buying back in? You just wait a, wait a day to buy back in? Yeah. Okay, just wait one day. Interesting. Or if there's another day that's a 2.5% return, I wait the following day. So be invested on every day that's not following a 2.5% day is the rule. Obviously, I'm not considering taxes, transaction costs, and yeah, sure. you know, blah 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 blah. You know, this is just a very simple rule based. Um, there's investment. yeah, on that front, there's something I've been thinking about that's related to this is the actual experience of actual investors in the real world. Like, hardly anyone I know has a portfolio that does what this is right here, right? Nobody put $10,000 in the S&P 500 and then had no other ad additions or withdrawals since 2005. Like things are happening, right? Either you're saving and adding to your portfolio or you retired or you had a life event and had to make a big withdrawal from your portfolio at some point in the middle of this, right? Perhaps you lost your job in the middle of a financial crisis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that... How does that logic of like contributions or withdrawals affect this in your mind? I have another slide here. It's a little bit blurry, but it's from Schwab, right? So even bad market timing trumps inertia, right? So if you stay in cash, you would have done really bad. If you have bad timing, this is um, a, a Schwab analysis from 2001 to 2020. It potentially includes three financial crises. Uh, it has more years of returns, so that's why the numbers are a little higher, but... Perfect timing, great. If, if you invest immediately, you obtain a certain result and a very closely a dollar cost averaging. So to me, the answer to that question is if you're aiming to take out money, if you take out money slowly or add money slowly, it's almost the same as investing immediately. That makes sense. Or taking out money immediately. So I don't think there is a perfect disalignment um, now, dollar cost averaging, if you're dollar cost averaging among many years, it's different than if in a couple of weeks, right? That's, I think then the timing itself is, is difficult. But all like most of the research I've done suggests that achieving perfect timing is very difficult. I don't, very smart investors may be able to do it, but it's not, the common investor cannot do it. It's, it's practically impossible in the long run. So then the, your options are like invest immediately a dollar cost average. They're pretty much the same. Timing, staying in cash is obviously worse um, in this period against the S&P 500. So, so I think to me, it's, it's pretty clear what the decision tree tells me what to do here, which is either invest immediately a dollar cost average because I can't time the market. I would agree. I think anyone who looks into this and is intellectually honest will come to the similar conclusion that they're not likely to have success. It's a negative expected value move to say, oh, I can time the market. Like I'm going to read the news flow and know when to get in or out. So if you were to dollar cost average, how would you explain that to a client who doesn't know what that is? That means that you take a pool of cash, 
instead of saying, I'm going to invest $100,000 today, what transfer and then a purchase, you are going to divide it into five or six or 12 uh, chunks and invest those over time. Exactly. And so if the, if the stock goes up, you buy a little bit less shares. If the stock price goes down, then you end up with more shares. Correct. I think that all else equal, the math says that markets on average have a positive expected return, right? Especially diversified portfolios. Like yeah. they should be going up. That that's like a force of gravity. Like you can't really you can't really beat that force of gravity that says, like, yeah, a diversified portfolio with some risk in it should be over time going up. Therefore, not being invested reduces return. I want to jump back real quick to this thought about like young people adding to their portfolio versus people reducing the size of their portfolio. Like if you're retired and you're reducing it, I just, I, I think the conclusion is that there are different portfolios that work better for those two different scenarios, right? There's like the volatility of having a, let's say you're in your thirties and you're adding to your 401k volatility is, I believe your friend over the years of you doing that, getting different entry points, adding to it, knowing that you don't need to draw down from that. More volatility and higher expected return is an additive function then. And I think volatility has a diminishing return for retirement portfolios. And there's like, there's PhDs, look up the work of uh, Wade Fow or the the history of the 4% rule that you can get really, really into the weeds about how to construct a robust retirement portfolio that's unlikely to have you running out of money despite various market conditions. There, there's a lot in there, but um, they just, there's portfolios with different functions and there's really good reasons for that, right? Like just buying the S&P 500 and retiring on it, I think we would both agree, not financial advice, is probably not the best way to construct a retirement portfolio. That's true. And, and, and what you said really rings true is that volatility actually is really detrimental for uh, a retiree a retiree yeah, draw down and so portfolio. how do you minimize that that volatility because what ends up mattering is i think there's a very good case for sequence of returns risk um and that sequence of returns risk in a way is expressed through volatility we're getting long key, right? so, but yes i'm with you yeah i but but you know if you have a hundred thousand dollars for retirement right and it's supposed to last you i don't know let's say five years, so it's 20K each year, but the market goes down 50% and you take out 20K, now you only have 30K left and it should last you four years. You know, it's it's not going to work, yep. right? If if that if that return happens at the at the end, if that bad return happens at the end of that of that timeline, let's and let's say you had a great four year run and then the last year you you, you need 20K um, and the market goes down, the effect on that 20% is going to be much smaller than initially. The, the problem of volatility, volatility increases the risk of, of these guys running out of money early. I, what's the final like thing to remember is uh, don't time the markets. Ta Structure your portfolio so that they are timeless. If you want to buy something that I think is cheap now, that is the only reason why you should essentially time it. It's not a good way of timing, saying that you're timing it. You're just buying when it's cheap, right? So like the, the Google stock went down 50%, but you believe that the fundamentals are the same as they were before they went down 50%, then it's cheaper now. You're not timing it. You're actually just buying a bargain. Agreed. I think that's a different mindset to be in as a portfolio manager compared to a, you know your baseline investor. So just know yeah. when you're switching. investing? Yeah, know when you're switching roles. Uh, which is hard to do if you're if you're doing both. If you're managing your household finances, kind of playing the planner manager role, and then switching over and being saying, "Oh, I'm a portfolio manager. I want to make optimal trades." Those are it's pretty hard to straddle those lines, which is why a lot of people delegate, outsource, use models to handle it for them. <laughs>